So, Dr. Joshua Jorgensen, he's a native salt, from Salt Lake City, Utah. He's an otolaryngologist, which is an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. He obtained his medical degree from Columbia University, College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York, and did his residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the University of Utah. He's also completed a year of research at, in the Los Angeles um, House Ear Institute, where he studied the molecular mechanism of drug toxicity and hearing restoration, and where he obtained advanced cochlear implant training. While in residency, he was awarded the Dean Gray Resident Research Award two years in a row for his research on inner ear drug toxicity. He continues his affiliation with the University of Utah as the adjunct faculty, furthering his research interest in diseases of the ear. And um, Dr. Jorgensen also works in private practice currently and operates at um, several of the local hospitals, including Primary Children's Hospital, St. Mark's, and, and um, Intermountain Hospital here. Dr. Jorgensen also like I said, is my hum husband, so I want to welcome him to the stage, and I'll let him just keep talking while I take care of the slides here. Thanks, Elena. So uh, I think Elena deserves a hand of applause for organizing this event. She really is amazing. Um, what you may not know about Elena is she's actually a registered dietitian and she's a specialist with uh, eating disorders and uh, sports nutrition. And she's also a former professional athlete. So uh, she's not just the person trying to make all these things happen tonight. She's a pretty amazing woman. And so doTERRA is lucky to have her. So I'm excited to talk to you tonight. I'm going to talk to you about um, my, the process that I have gone through to integrate essential oils into my practice. And uh, just as an introduction while she's getting that ready, Elena has, from the time that she brought home the $500 kit, to try, and to try to explain to me why she purchased that, uh, to the time that I actually started using essential oils in my patients, it, it took a while. It took a while. Um, is that better? Okay. But anyway, with persistence, um, I as a, as a doctor, just like Dr. Winterton, began to realize the medicinal properties of these natural products and how important they are and how, how essential they can be in practice because of the side effects of medications and, and because um, this is really what so many people are looking for. And, uh, and so I'm excited to talk to you more about that. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just uh, tell you a story. So, um, anyway, you got it? Okay. So, I'm, if anybody from that works in my office is, is uh, watching this, um, they've been observing this transition where in my office, every once in a while, something will pop up, essential oils related. Uh, at first, it was just a diffuser. At first, it was a smell, uh, for example. Around Christmas time, I was diffusing uh, on guard in my, uh, in my office, and um, I kind of forgot about it. I went around the corner and was seeing patients, and, and people kept talking about, what's that smell? What's that smell? And, uh, and someone said, do you smell that potpourri? And I said, yeah, I do. And uh, I totally forgot that it was my essential oils that smelled kind of like potpourri at Christmas time. Uh, but, but having a smell like that, um, that can be calming and relaxing and uh, intriguing at the same time uh, does a lot in a practice. So let me go on to this. So I've been exposed to essential oils for a long time now. Actually, my mom uh, would use essential oils and massage me after football practice, and, uh, and I really, really loved that and have fond memories of that. And uh, as I mentioned, my wife introduced me to uh, doTERRA essential oils, and now I'm hooked on Deep Blue Rub, Lifetime Vitality Pack. Clap if you want. Uh, 
and then peppermint, lavender, melaleuca, and, and, and so many more. Um, when uh, I think Dr. Winterton asked the question, or someone asked the question, has essential oils um, changed your life? I raised my hand. Uh, I'm one of those people. Let me tell you what happened last week. I actually just had surgery. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And one of my partners just performed surgery on me. I've been having chronic sinus problems, which is partly why I have the sore throat. So I apologize for that. But anyway, this is, this is my experience uh, with essential oils. Now, can you tell in this slide here who's having surgery and who's doing doTERRA Diamond Club? So anyway, in talking to Dr. Winterton before my surgery, he gave me some recommendations. He said, okay, before the surgery, I want you to put melaleuca and oregano near the side of the surgery. And that's my nose. I said, okay, I'll do that. And I, I did have to dilute it a bit, Dr. Winterton. Um, and, uh, and then also he gave me the, his protocol for using um, peppermint and ginger for nausea um, before and after surgery. And I use that. And I have to tell you, I have this huge prescription of Zofran for my doctor that I have not opened. And I didn't have any nausea or vomiting after the surgery. So thank you, Dr. Winterton. Now, this is a, an after picture of me in the car. I apologize for showing this, but... What we really should show is an after picture of Elena after uh, Diamond Club. But uh, anyway, um, so in the recovery room, I was waking up and still totally out of it. And um, when I finally came to, my wife said, you kept asking for deep blue rub. <laughs> I'm serious. I really did. And, uh, I, and Elena came in. She had to go run an errand. Um, and she came in just at the right moment and had my deep blue rub for me. So. And then also I've been applying melaleuca and lavender to my nose and also putting melaleuca, a drop of melaleuca in my sinus rinse. And it's really been helping to, to rinse out my sinuses with the healing process. And uh, my surgeon who did my surgery, he says, I wish everybody took care of their nose like yours. Uh, yours looks great. And I, and I kind of told him what I've been doing. So hopefully he's watching tonight. Um, and along with my perioperative antibiotics, I've been taking the Lifetime Vitality Pack. So anyway, that's my recentest recent experience with essential oils. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. So I am, um, I am a researcher, but I've always done the research with the goal of becoming a doctor. Um, but I did, my, my undergrad was in neuroscience, and uh, I was gonna become a brain surgeon, and in fact, started a program, but I found my niche with ear, nose, and throat, and spe specifically studying the ear and the hearing mechanism, which I think there's more neuroscience there than than uh, almost in the brain. It's just, it's just an incredible organ. And some of the study I've done includes testing toxicity of drugs uh, on the inner ear. And the model that we use, we, um, we dissect, I dissect uh, newborn mouse cochleas or inner ears and put this on a culture slide and then um, test it, test, put drugs on there and test it to see if it will, if it will uh, have an effect. And we, we published this uh, study where we showed that acetaminophen at high doses actually has an ototoxic effect or effect on the inner ear, inner ear cells. And this is important because there have been several cases of patients who have been abusing um, hydrocodone or Lortab uh, together with acetaminophen. And everyone always thought it was the combination or it was the, the uh, narcotic, but we actually showed that it's the acetaminophen at these, high, these toxic levels which is a good case for using essential oils, right, based on Dr. Winterton's talk. Um, these, these chemicals can have a toxic effect when, they're, when there's too much of them. So what are essential oils? Now, this is just an overview because you've already, uh, we've already been talking about that, but this is, this is how I think about it. Nature's medicine to help plants heal from, their own, from injury or infection. So the plants have this on, on their leaves, and if they get an infection or if they get an injury, the oils help them heal. So it's the plant's medicine. Maybe it's not God's medicine, but it's the, it's the plant's medicine that, that God created. Um, and uh, anyway, there is this transition for um, tradition of using essential oils or natural products and observing what's going on to actual hardcore research. And Dr. Winterton talked to you all about that. 
Anyway, I'm going to give you some examples of going through the literature and, and one by one looking at different articles and seeing what we can learn. Okay? So, first of all, if you do this literature search on anti-inflammatory and essential oils, this is what you will get. Okay? And this is the article that Dr. Winterson brought up. So this is a great article. And it, it talks about so many of the essential oils. And it talks specifically about this, this cascade of inflammation. Now, everything starts here on the outside of the cell. And then this is the signal process on the inside of the cell. Okay? And we know that certain drugs that they've studied affect this process. For example, this is the molecule that the main component in ibuprofen. And this is aspirin over here. And they both block, both block this main pathway right here. So we know that. Okay, so this, is, this diagram is similar to the one before. It just has an extra arm. So instead of just going here, there's another branch. Okay? And um, essentially, at both of these branches, you have multiple essential oils or the components that block this, anti -inflam this inflammatory pathway, um, giving them their anti-inflammatory properties. And these are some examples, limonene, uh, sineal, 1,8-sineal, also called eucalyptal because it's one of the main ingredients in eucalyptus oil. So this is just an example of, of what Dr. Winterton was, was saying. Now, I don't have here all the different classes. I'm just going to show you pictorially um, when there's some similarity in, in structure, there's similarity in function. So this is D-limonene. Here's the molecule. So you can see it has this circular shape with this kind of uh, pedestal here. Um, and that's 90% of citrus oils, peppermint, and, and so many other oils. 1,8-sineal, or eucalyptol, that's in eucalyptus, peppermint, lavender. Look at this structure. It's very similar. Very similar. Very simple uh, structure that's, that's uh, replicated. And then you have aspirin, which um, uh, we learned from Dr. Winterton is from willow bark. But at high concentrations, it has this very specific effect. Now look at, the, look, at, look at this. It has a very similar underlying structure to these other molecules, plus some other added features. So that's how I'd like you to think about this, um, that the components, the main components in these essential oils are like drugs or medications, but they're in their natural form. So what are essential oils? Complex chemical compounds with multiple healing properties. That's why when, I, you, know, when you first hear about the oils and you hear that you know, lavender is good for infection, it's good for calming, it's good for so many different things, it's kind of hard to believe, right? But it's, it's for this reason that there's so many different compounds in there um, that have these properties. Um, so anyway, but each of those oils has three to four main ingredients. Okay, and those ingredients, that determines the, the main function for that oil or the main functions for that oil. So let's take case in point lavender. So if you do a literature search on lavender, and lavender, um, this is one of the main, actually I did a search on lavender and chemical composition. I found this article. Uh, it's a great article, and the reason why I like this article is because it goes into detail, and it taught me a lot about essential oils. First of all, here's the gas chromatograph of lavender, so it shows the different components. Uh, um, as spikes here, where they've tested it and shown that this, this pattern represents lavender. Okay. Now, this is a list of all the different components in lavender uh, that they t in the lavender that they tested. That's uh, 47. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So there's a lot of things in there. Now, let's look at the main ingredients. The, the chief ingredient is 1,5-dimethyl-1-vinyl-4-hexanyl-butyrate. Uh, anyway, um, I had to practice that, too, and I'm a doctor. Um, 44% is this molecule. Now, there's a simpler name, and I'll tell you that in a second. The second, the second one is, I'll just call this one, 137. Okay? And, uh, and then you have eucalyptol, 7%, and then camphor, 4%. And, and um, camphor is something that's commonly used and known. So, when you think about using lavender, those are the, those are the components. Now, let's look closely at them. Here's eucalyptol just to give you an idea of the chemical structure. Here's the 137. Another name is, is beta-osamine. That's a little bit easier to, to chew on. Um, then there's camphor, 
And then there's this other one, which you can call linalool or linalool acetate, depending on which configuration it's in. So that's, so th that is the main blueprint for lavender. Okay. Now the same article showed a graph <coughs> where the process of peroxidation, which is the process inside the cell where oxida uh, oxidative um, compounds are released and uh, things are broken down, uh, in other words, oxidation, is inhibited by lavender. So lavender is an antioxidant, okay? And this graph shows it, that at a certain concentration, you have 80 to 90% inhibition of oxidation with lavender. And they attribute that to the main oils in, or the main components in lavender. This article also talks about the bacterial, uh, the antibacterial properties of lavender. So you can see that it showed antibacterial properties to, to staph and a couple other, uh, to E. coli, and a couple other um, germs or bacteria. Okay, so, so this is a, a good way to, to, talk, to the, um, talk to people about the oils, telling them what exactly they are. Let's take another case in point, peppermint. So if you do a literature search on peppermint, you'll find this article, okay, chemical composition of peppermint. And um, here's another list of everything that's in peppermint, so that's not as long as lavender, but I assure you that pepperder, pe peppermint is very cool oil. So 53% menthol, so that's the main ingredient in peppermint. And that's why when you, when you uh, open a bottle of peppermint or you apply it directly to your, your forehead, um, you notice an effect right away. Uh, and that the effect of menthol on your nerves and on your skin it's, it's very real. So go ahead and do that. I, I can hear several people are doing that right now in the audience. But if you have the, the uh, peppermint, open it up and try it. Put it on your forehead. I actually do this in my office. I put a drop in my hand, and I take that drop, and I put some on my patient's forehead and some on my forehead. And by the time they notice an effect, I notice it too. And, and it's pretty obvious. And, and this is my migraine patient specifically. So then there are a couple other um, components, chief components to uh, peppermint. So this same article talked about the antifungal properties of peppermint. So that's important. It also talked about peppermint breaking up fungal biofilm. Now biofilm is where either bacteria or fungus creates this film to protect itself so it can keep growing. And that's a, a main, pro that's a big problem in medicine. And uh, we're trying to find good ways to treat this. And there actually, there's actually a lot of research on um, treating biofilm with essential oils. Um, and one of those main essential oils is melaleuca. We're doing a lot of research on that. So what is the differ difference between me medication and essential oils? So here's a picture of the aspirin, and then here's peppermint oil. Obviously, you can see that peppermint is a lot more complex, right? Uh, although it has components in it that are similar to aspirin. And then the aspirin that we take, which is a pill, this is this molecule plus a few other ingredients multiplied by thousands. So a medication is a single molecular compound. This is, these are generic, term, generic ideas. Very high concentration, single mechanism of action, or, or a few mechanisms of action, which can have severe lasting effect. Essential oils, this is also found on that handout we gave you. Essential oils are complex multiple chemical mixtures. They have varying concentrations of the chemicals, multiple mechanisms of action, and they're aromatic. And that's very important because they diffuse easily into tissues. They diffuse easily into the air. They, um, the effect, if, if you could keep them there and trap them there, they would have a, a lasting effect. But by nature, they diffuse. And so that's another reason why essential oils are safer because they naturally go away. They don't get stuck in your body. So here's the big question, and this is very similar to the question Dr. Winterson asked. How can health professionals rely on essential oils for a consistent health benefit for their patients? Well, this is where I think doTERRA has done a, a, an incredible job with their product, making this internal standard, cer certified pure therapeutic grade, where they essentially are, are making sure that the essential oils are consistent with these active ingredients. And that's important because those active ingredients determine the, the medical properties if you're using the, the, soils, the essential oils as medicine, excuse me. So 
and we talked a little bit about Dr. Uh, Rob Pappas, the chemist. So you can you can go to his website and learn more about what he's doing and some of the research. But this is this is a this is a, a real great resource, and that's why that's why I use DoTerra in my practice because I feel like I can get consistent results with my patients because of this internal standard. Now, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about how I use the uh, oils in my practice. I use them aromatically, um, for example, for mood and creating an environment. Now, uh, I use them for germ control, aromatically, and also I use them as complementary medicine. So, if you do a literature search on essential oils and anxiety, you'll find this great article that in a dentist's office, they used orange and lavender, and it was diffused, and it led to a decrease in anxiety and improved mood in their patients. So, you wouldn't be surprised that I started using these in my office, and when I showed this article to my dentist, he started using them in his too. So, uh, so it catches on when there's research articles like this out there, that it catches on with the health professionals. Now, when do I use essential oils in my practice? I use them when it's not working, okay? When, when we have failed medical management with other medications or treatments to avoid the side effects. I use them together with medications. So in my migraine patients, I'll sometimes have them on a migraine medicine they take every day, but I'll also tell them to stop the migraine when it comes on with essential oils, okay? And when there's no good treatment. The other thing is, there are many patients that come to me that are seeking complementary medicine, and when my first response is, well, I can give you a prescription for that, they, they don't like that. And so I like to, get, I like to gauge what, what they're looking for and what they're wanting, and, and, this, is, and this is what they're wanting. Uh, to promote, to promote self-awareness or lifestyle. I think that's really helped in our family, and I think it's helped happening in my patients. To discourage them, discourage them from always going to the drug, uh, kind of like what we talked about at the beginning, right? We don't, we're, our society wants this quick solution. Um, and the essential oils can be kind of a deterrent from always going to the drugs, right? Because this is something that has an immediate effect. It can help, but it doesn't have these bad side effects. And it makes me feel good, and it smells good. So, um, so that's good. And then for overall wellness. So common, common things that I see, that I can see great application for essential oils, ear infections. Tonsil infections, pain after tonsillectomy, sinus infections, loss of smell. I've used that on a couple patients for loss of smell, and, and one patient actually had their smell come back. Now, this is another anecdote. Uh, I think we need to research this, but, um, but she really felt that it helped. And uh, she was smelling about five of the oils nonstop for two days, just so you know. Um, and, uh, and then for migraine. And also for other conditions that we don't know how to treat well or, or, or that are really debilitating, like tinnitus or dizziness. So in my profession, my specialty, I really see a lot of applications for essential oils. Now, um, my experience with essential oils. Okay, first of all, earaches, peppermint, basil, lavender. If you apply a mixture and get that combinatory effect or that synergistic effect, you can really change what your ear is feeling. Sinus infections, like I said, I use this on myself. Now, um, I'm not giving a formal recommendation to use this as a doctor, right? We need, to, we need to study this, but health professionals like myself can start giving their patients protocols to do this and follow them and chart them carefully and make sure they're okay. And by the way, we do that with medications all the time. We, we test medications on patients to make sure that they're working for that patient. Sore throat. Many different oils, smell loss, migraine, tinnitus. Um, okay, you guys have on that handout, on the back of the handout, it has all of these on there, okay? I didn't mean to rush you through the most important part of the talk. Um, this, this is just based on my experience as a doctor, okay? And Telling you exactly how to do them is a, totally, is a different story. So how can health professionals feel comfortable recommending or prescribing essential oils as complementary medicine? How do you take the next step? Well, they can either have a wife like mine 
or they can do these the next steps here. So standardization of natural medicines. So we talked about the internal standards that doTERRA has, and I think, and that's great. There's also international standards. For example, um, and then clinical, based on clinical research. For example, for tea tree oil, the International Standard Organization for Standardization has a definition for tea tree oil based on the concentrations that are required down in this, uh, down here, concentrations for each main ingredient. So there's a standard, and this standard is used in research and it should be used in practice as well. And because doTERRA offers their internal standard, I think they can stick to the standard more easily. Okay. And then this is the main ingredient in tea tree oil, which when we talk about antimicrobial or antibacterial properties of tea tree, this is the main um, antibacterial. Okay. And to be, for this to be tea tree oil, you need at least 30% of this, 30 to 48%. I believe the one in, in the doTERRA is uh, around 40%. Okay, so if you get into literature for tea tree oil and you look up tea tree oil in MRSA, that's a big problem, right? MRSA, um, resistant staph infections. There's a random, randomized controlled trial on tea tree oil topically to treat MRSA. And that's MRSA infections of the skin and also MRSA in the nose. So that's directly related to my profession. And they pretty much showed that other antibacterial solutions that you wash on the, on the uh, skin aren't as effective as tea tree oil, which is pretty amazing in this, stu in this study. Now, they did show that mupirocin ointment, which is an anti antibiotic, that is more effective. It's 75% effective against MRSA and uh, for the nose, whereas uh, tea tree oil is closer to 50%. But you can get resistance with the high concentrations. So you might want to trade and not do the uh, an the antibiotic first. Do the do the tea tree oil and prevent resistance, which is the problem in the first place with MRSA. Okay, and then you, then there's just a ton of different articles, tea tree oil and uh, and staph biofilm. So breaking up those bacteria. This is a picture from this article. So this is just a bunch of uh, bacteria in a biofilm. This is after a 1% application of 1% tea tree oil. So we're not talking a drop of, of melaleuca. We're talking about um, melaleuca diluted with coconut oil down to 1%. And a drop of that applied to this biofilm broke up that bacteria. And that's after 24 hours. That's pretty impressive. Don't you agree? So uh, antifungal properties of, of tea tree oil. So there's, there's articles on that as well. So you can see, and then tea tree oil in otitis externa or outer ear infection. So you can see as a health provider, if I start searching, it just, it just keeps coming. It's, it's pretty remarkable. So I can treat patients with outer ear infections with tea tree oil, and it was shown in this study to be effective. Okay? And it was shown that against staph and other, and, and other uh, bacteria, that tea tree oil is effective. Now, Pseudomonas, it's effective, but a certain percentage of the time, it's not effective, and that's and that's the main and that's a very difficult one to treat, and that's pretty much a difficult infection that of a of a uh, bacteria that pretty much lives at hospitals. So we have really difficult we have really uh, good drugs for that if we need to, but you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, have to be treated for that. Okay, so if I start using telling my patients to pour essential oils down their ear. There's a little bit of an issue, don't you, don't you think, as a doctor? Um, when I first put on my white coat, I promised that I would do no harm. And now that I'm a specialist in the ear and I've done research on ototoxicity or the toxicity of the inner ear to chemicals, I need to make sure that this is going to be safe. If someone has a hole in their ear drum, for example, I'm not going to tell them to put, to put oils in there. Um, and we're currently working on a research study to test tea tree oil in my culture model where we can see if the inner ear of, of, of mice are affected. And so as soon as we get that information, we'll let you know. It's going to take a while. Um, and as Dr. Winterton talked about, there are many different uh, interactions with the medications that we already give our, doc give our patients um, with these health products. Um, and we have to be aware as professionals of these interactions. So how do we integrate essential oils into modern medicine? 
And I'm getting towards the end here. So um, physicians and research will summarize the research. So do what I've done, do a literature search, and we can summarize it. And um, doTERRA has done a great thing with that, with uh, aromaticscience.com. And I wanted to show you a little bit more about that. We've also put some information out about a, a website that we're working on where we're testing, testing these uh, protocols, okay? So aromatic science, so if you go there, this is the main page, um, and you try to learn more about one of the essential oils, you can do, you can bypass the lit search that I did and just go learn about the oil and then see all of the different studies. And so it really is a great resource. Um, and, and it's also a great resource for, for physicians. There's a physician's forum there where we can go there and talk about the research and try to figure out what's going on with essential oils. So I think that's gonna be great. So let me just introduce this other website, Protocol, which uh, I've been working on, and Dr. Winterton's helped me on that, and uh, many other healthcare professionals were working on it together, where physicians and research summarize the research. Physicians and researchers summarize it. We develop the treatment protocols based on the research. We test the protocols for their effectiveness, and by doing that, now you have a bridge for the physicians to start integrating into their practice. So what is a protocol? It's a step-by-step -step regimen. It's exactly how I want you to take the oil, okay? Created by professionals and supported by literature and then tested on the site for its effectiveness. So this is the concept. So, um, so this, you know, this isn't new to, to all of you. For patients who want natural solutions, professional guidance and feedback on their care. I see this really as something to really help providers to get involved who are open to natural medicine, but they don't quite know how to get started, how to integrate it. They want to see the effectiveness. And then the products, uh, we want to make sure they're safe and that they're effective. So anyway, on this site, you can actually enroll for a protocol. There are a couple protocols up there now. Um, and it will tell you exactly how to do how to do the protocol. And then you give your feedback. And, um, and then we can get immediate results. And you can see your results and see how, how you compare. And providers can create protocols and start integrating this into their practice through the website. So create, create a protocol. So let me just give you a, just a touch, a taste of this with, a, with migraine. So these are all the articles I've researched for migraine to support how I use migraine in my practice. Okay. And um, this is a summary. So I've summarized all the different articles, including recommendations from uh, Modern, uh, Modern Essentials book and, uh, and to try to figure out what we're doing. So a couple examples. This one study showed that a 10% menthol topically, 10% 10, 10 menthol topically applied to the forehead showed significant headache pain relief at two hours and over a sustained, sustained period. So remember, pepper, or menthol is the main ingredient in peppermint. And in fact, doTERRA peppermint oil has around 44%. So I know based on this, or at least I can guess based on this, that I don't want to dilute peppermint by more than a fourth when I'm applying it topically to get this effect. Now who knows, maybe the, they could have gotten an effect at a lower concentration. But anyway, this, this, is, this is guiding the protocol. Another example, 71% of patients inhaling lavender had a reduction in headache severity. Did you know that lavender is good for, uh, for migraines? Uh, compared to 47% in placebo. So 70%, 40%, 50%. Um, there's a significant difference using the lavender to decrease their migraine headaches. And so for that, and based on how, lo how long they used it and, and just reading the article, I've developed a protocol where they need to diffuse the lavender for at least 30 minutes in the morning and night to decrease the migraines. And that's if they're getting migraine headaches daily or trying to prevent them. So this is a list of the, the different protocols. And uh, I invite you to go to the website. We currently have a uh, protocol up there for migraine, which is a pretty intense protocol. Uh, but if you have migraines, you're gonna do it and you're gonna, and you're gonna see your results and, and get relief from your symptoms. Um, Dr. Winterson has a protocol up there for nausea and vomiting. And uh, he mentioned, you know, he helped me with my surgery. There's a protocol there. If you're going to have surgery, what exactly to do after your surgery, and then how to report back and let us know how you did. 
Uh, so that's going to be really important. In his protocol, if you're pregnant and you have nausea and vomiting, you can also do that protocol. Or if you have nausea for any other medical condition, you can do the, do the protocol. And then we can get the feedback, and then you can see the results graphically on the website um, of how that's going to, of how that looks and how effective it is. So anyway, you got the handout for this, so go check it out. I think we're really excited about this. All the doctors and professionals that I've talked about are really excited about this. Okay, so bottom line, to the future clinical application of essential oils and ENT, I'm going to better be able to control infection, and I'm going to have to do less surgery, unfortunately. I like to do surgery. Um, but it's best for my patients that they don't have surgery unless they absolutely need it. So there'll be less ear tubes, less tympanoplasties, less mastoid surgeries, less tonsillectomies or sinus surgery, less reliance on drugs, and more emphasis on lifestyle and nutrition. And I think that's the bottom, bottom line message with essential oils. Essential oils are nature's medicine, complex multiple chemical mixtures with multiple mechanisms of action. And to integrate these into modern medicine, we need to rely on the research, have clinical judgment with healthcare professionals involved, and these protocols to establish the effectiveness. In summary, this is a quote from Thomas Edison that Dr. Wenderson gave me. The doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. And that's the bottom line message, and that's our goal. And uh, anyway, thank you so much, and uh, on to the next part. <laughs>